So, question number one, and remember you're being easy on me. I'm super, I'm, by the way, I'm really excited that we're doing this because I, uh, I love talking to you anyway, and so doing an interview with you is an extra bonus. Yay. Okay. Um, so, I'm doing a leader, I have to interview a leader, which is you, and um, first question is, tell me about your journey that brought you to your current position. Well, actually, maybe can we describe for me your current position? Yes. So I currently am the CEO and founder of a digital media agency and communications company called A Life in Shorts. And that company is based here in New York City. And we also have a satellite office in Medellin, Colombia. And basically what we do is a couple different things. We, in a line, I basically help people tell stories that sell. So we work with brands of all sizes on different campaigns in terms of creating campaigns, creating content around a specific end goal. So right now we're working with the government of India, for example, and they're, they're, they've launched an initiative that's trying to help one million people create one billion jobs. They've come to us to create all of their social media content, to create all of their video content, and to help them raise money to open different accelerators in rural parts of India that will provide different jobs to the people that are living in those areas. Um, we're also working with a foundation that has a, a, a cure, a solution to stage four, a non-toxic treatment for stage four terminal cancer patients. And again, like today, we just shot a video with them um, and we're doing a lot of social, we're gonna be doing all their social media campaign as well as t helping them tell their story. And then we work with you know brands of all sizes from big brands that you know, like Intel, they're launching a competition or a product to smaller startups in San Francisco that have one or two co-founders that want to raise money. Um, they come to us to figure out what is the best way to tell their story, where is the best platform, is it video, is it written, is it oral, and how is how can they tell that story in the most exciting way possible? So that's the agency side, and then we get hired to do that. And then because of that, I get invited to give keynote speeches and conferences around the world. Um, about the power of branding, about the power of messaging, how you can use storytelling to make sales, and that takes me all over the place, and that's really fun. So that's sort of what I do. Amazing. Thank you, Randy. You're so cool. Um, so how did you... I'm serious. <laughs> Thank you. That's very good. So how did you get to this position? So I think that for me, the, the things that you know, I'm, I'm a big fan of like telling people to do what they're really good at and ignore the rest of it um, because there's just there's only so much time on this planet and so many people, you know, especially in the American media has really brainwashed a lot of people into thinking that you should focus on your weaknesses and it makes zero sense to me. I'm, I'm just such a big fan of going all in on the three or four things that you're really good at and figuring out a way to make a living at that. Um, and so for me, I've, I've been really consistently throughout all of my life and, you know, wh whether it was as an athlete or whether it was doing, you know, in law school, creating human rights projects or whether it was working for Mayor Bloomberg here in New York City or whether it's running my own company, I think I've done a couple of things really well. Number one, um, I am a good storyteller. So I, I can very quickly get to the core of what makes a product or a service or an idea or an initiative or a cause very unique and very special. And very quickly, I can help you decide. And it's funny, I even did this with you once. Remember, Renny? Like I made for your birthday that year, I sent you that little one pager thing that I made of you, like who you are as a human. And that was after just knowing you for a couple of weeks. And so like I, that's a skill. And I think that it's a really hard thing for a lot of people to do. Just people are so in their own lives and in their own service and in their own product and their own idea that they, they have a harder time figuring out how do I tell that story. So I've been able to very quickly take a lot of different a lot of information um, and been able to synthesize that down into a very core message. That's a very important thing. Number two, I think that I just am very good at people. And I think that I understand people well, I understand what people want to be doing, I understand what people will be doing, and I understand how that 
what how that plays out in a in a world where you can kind of create a business around doing what you love um, and so for me people is is my oxygen is is my is my caffeine um, and being around people and connecting people is something that I really love and then the third thing is I think that I, I see a world that could exist more so than a world that does exist and so it's funny because then this idea that I love that I think you'll get a kick out of is called idea sex right where you take one or two or three ideas let them come together and have sex and then see what's born out of that so when you combine sort of a love for people and a love for storytelling and seeing a world the way that you think it could be instead of the way that it is what that ends up becoming is basically what I've created for myself now, which is helping people and organizations and brands and companies figure out how do you take what's important to you, how do you take what you care about, and how do you create a narrative around that that is so uh, out of the box in terms of what you're thinking about that you create something really unique and really beautiful and really powerful. And so, I think that you know, as a leader, those are the three things that I'm that I'm good at, and that's I've decided to go all in on that and focus on that, and it's been it's been super fun. Um, but you know, that's kind of a longer answer. But more specifically, you know, I saw that play out. I was a football player, I was a college athlete, and um, I was the guy that people came to for advice. I was the guy that people came to when they. I was the guy that coaches came to to give tours for high school students that were thinking about coming to our university. I was the, the best recruiter. And then when I, after college, I, you know, I went on to, to, to do stuff in San Francisco where I started different projects. I started a project in the Dominican Republic. I started a project in Argentina. All of these things required me to be able to connect with people, and recognize why they would want to be a part of whatever we were doing, and then story tell to them in, that, in the way that made sense to get them closer to that thing. Um, and then working for Mike Bloomberg, I recruited hundreds and hundreds of people to be on the campaign in a very short amount of time. And if you think about, Rennie, if you think about like what it means to recruit people to volunteer their time, like that in and of itself is hard because time is something we don't have a lot of. And to be able to recruit 600 people in like three or four months, which is what I did, I was only, it wasn't because of me, it was only able to do it because I could fully understand what these people wanted and how I could give it to them. I see how you have these skills that have led you to be where you are. Um, but when did you decide to kind of like jump off from the typical I'm employed and I work to I'm creating my own business kind of thing? And how did that happen? I think that, you know, there, there, were, a few, there were a few moments that really led me to believe that I was supposed to be my own boss. The first was, I'll never forget, like, I was, my parents were in town for my dad's birthday around Thanksgiving, and it was the last year of my, last year I ever had a, a job as, as a, an employee, and I remember being so stressed out to ask my boss for time off, and my parents flew from Illinois, and they got a hotel, and they were spending all this money, and I remember thinking, like, this is sort of ridiculous that I feel so nervous about asking for time off and I was like what if I never had to ask anyone for time off again and that was kind of the first moment the second moment I, I have to give my ex-girlfriend a lot of credit her name was Janice and she was really an important person in my life she was a Broadway performer and she was just a scrappy scrappy entrepreneur and I remember we we were living together for a time and um, and I came home one night very frustrated with my job and she looked at me and she, she said, you know, in her very, very sweet way of communicating, she said, you know, Brian, here's what I don't understand. And, and I said, what's that? She's like, you are at your best when you are a free spirit. You are such a free spirit, and that is when you are at your best. I don't understand why you spend so much time suppressing that. And, like, that was sort of one of those moments that definitely changed my life. And I remember looking at her and thinking, like, she's 1,000% right and I'm suppressing my free spiritness. And um, I actually quit my job the very next day. And, you know, I, I still tell her, you know, in fact, um, and the, fi the final moment that, that really kind of, this was unrelated to being my own boss, but like 
to, to kind of honor her role in my life when I was I was I gave my two weeks notice and then I had a certain amount of hours left of paid leave time you know the, the city of New York gives you paid leave time and I think I had like one hour left and I said to her Janice like I have this one hour left what should I do with it should I use it should I toss it to the wind what should I do with it and she said Brian it's it, it, it may only be an hour but it's your hour and that literally became the slogan of my talk that I gave over the next, even up until today that I give, it's called, It's Your Hour. And um, it was, that was the moment that that speech was born. But I think, you know, coming from my father's Lebanese and my father's very entrepreneurial, Lebanese, my family is very entrepreneurial. Um, you know, my uncle did the whole food cart thing and <clears throat> grandparents opened a store, you know, immigrant story where no English, no knowledge of anything in this little town in Illinois opened a store, grocery store, meat, eggs, cheese, um, you know, real local grinding stuff, 16, 17, 18 hour days. And I just think that it's really in my blood. And um, and I, I don't think there's anything wrong with having a job. Like I know plenty of people have jobs that are really happy. But for me, uh, I just, I actually can't breathe um, in a job. And so, and, and you don't realize that until, and I think there's value in having a job for five, six, seven, eight years before you become your own boss. But like now the the thought of going back to sort of a nine to five um, is, is something that, that, that I don't want. Um, there are obviously like trade-offs. Like, you know, my life is a hell of a lot more stressful now than it was when I had a nine to five job. My life is, you know, it's lonelier. I work five times more. Um, I'm responsible for my own bills. I don't have health insurance provided, but like, it's just, it's my truth right now. And, and, and I think that if I can t say anything to whoever reads what you write is find your truth. Like maybe you're really, really, really happy being a nurse than be a nurse. Like I'm not trying, I'm not trying to tell you what to do. I'm just telling you what works for me. What does leadership mean to you? Uh, leadership for me just means, and like, it's cool that Nick's here, and it's cool that like you know my, my some of my team would would I think acknowledge this. For me, it's just like I want to help the people around me get whatever they want. Like okay. so many leaders suffocate their staff and their their employees, and uh, it's all very self-serving. Like for me, leadership is how I and I spent an immense amount of time yesterday. It was kind of painful extent talking to. Yesterday I was had lots of conversations with my assistant about like what do you want because I want to help people get what they want and for me like I have I'm lucky I have a staff that works very very hard and uh, I'm a very demanding boss but at the same time I think that because they can feel that I genuinely genuinely care about them like to the point where I'm trying to find them apartments or I'm trying to find them lawyers or I'm trying to do things behind the scenes that they don't even know about. Um, they can feel some of that stuff and they work harder because of it. So I think that a good leader cares a lot more about the success of the people around him than he does himself. And in, t in return, she or he as the boss actually gets way more output from the people that are working with them. The other thing I would say is I just accept the fact that every single thing that goes right and every single thing that goes wrong and every single thing in between is 1000% my fault. And uh, when you can make that shift as a boss or as a leader, it doesn't have to be as a boss, as a leader, I think that everything changes. You know, the blame game is toxic and it's contagious. And if, if that's the culture that you create around a workspace, you, I can 1,000% guarantee you that you'll lose. You know, companies call me in to do consulting for them. They're having a hard time with their sales teams or they're having a hard time unifying departments about how they talk about things. And the, the number one most common reason that that happens is because everyone's pointing fingers at everyone else and no one's actually doing any work. And so when you are, as the leader, tell your staff every single day, maybe not every day, but these guys hear from me all the time, every single thing that goes wrong is my fault. Today, I was talking to Nick, and I was frustrated because everything seemed to be taking too long in terms of how we were transferring data and uh, from camera to the computer to the camera to the computer. And, and, and I said to him, like, I'm not criticizing you. I just, we need to figure out a solution to this. 
in my head what I was saying is like, Brian, this is your fault. Like you should, you should have talked to this t to him about this before. You should have a system in place, right? And we're gonna we're gonna put a system in place. But like, it's all my fault. I actually heard once um, this story about this boss that um, you know something went wrong. Um, this person was in charge of a big responsibility for their first time, and they totally blew it. But they like they were supposed to get supplies somewhere at a certain time. And they weren't there, and um, this person was terrified because she had to tell this boss really high up, oh crap, you know, the stuff is not here, and what was really nice is they called in a conference, they had everyone talk, and the head boss says, okay, this happened. My part in this mistake was that I didn't give you the all the information that you needed, and kind of like set that example, and then other people said, something I could have done different, mm, so that nice. everyone took their responsibility, and it set that culture yep. of not blaming each other, seeing how, what their part was, and how they could, you know, make things better for the future, so yes, that's... That's cool. So, when I thought of interviewing you, um, yes, you are a manager, because you have um, your own business, but I, you're also a thought leader, you have these... Um, I don't know what you call them, but podcasts or yep. TV shows or who knows what, where you reach out to so many people. So <laughs> you're amazing. Yes, thank you for knowing that. Yes. Um, so can you tell me about how that feels to you? Kind of like knowing that so many people are, are looking to you out in the world, not just your employees. I mean, Renny, it's super humbling. You know, it's like, it's it's the greatest gift that I could ever ask. It's, I don't care about things at all. I don't want a car, I don't need a fancy house. Like I literally, I'm not, I'm zero motivated by by, by physical things. Um, I am 100% motivated by admiration and by service and by helping people and by connecting with humans. And so, um, you know, it, for me, the fact that you even know that I have a podcast and a in a YouTube show, for me, the fact that you even know that I talk to people, for me, the fact that you've ever even spent one minute listening to my stuff is a huge honor. You know, I always crack up because people are always complaining. You know, I have I only have a thousand followers on Facebook, and I'm like, dude, do you realize that that means that there are one thousand people on this planet that have taken the time out to actually care about what you have to say? and that may or may not even be listening, and that may or may not even be taking action based on what you say. It's like we've really lost touch in this world with the level of impact that we can have as humans because of all these like millions of people that we want following us. I, for me, it's just such an honor that one person would leave one comment or one like on anything that I put up. Like, so for me, how I think about it is a couple things. Number one, it's an honor. Number two, it's, it's, it's a responsibility to be very honest with what's happening, you know? So there are so many, you know, fake entrepreneurs right now that are taking the picture of the Lamborghini that they rented, pretending like they owned it. They're taking the picture of the seven story, you know, the seven bedroom penthouse, pretending like they just bought it. And that's just such a danger because that really leads to this facade and this falsity in people's minds that it's gonna be an easy thing. For me, the fact that so many people, and we do, you know, thankfully have a lot of people that listen and watch our stuff. And for me, I, the only reason I'm using, the only things that I care about with these platforms is number one, bringing you as much value as I possibly can through the truth, which is, this is a whole lot of hard work and sacrifice. And number two, I want to, the only reason I care about having a big following is because I want to influence culture to the point where if I want to put on, um, like you're going to Haiti next week. What, you know, if, if you came to me and said, hey, I want to build these two schools, my dream would be like, okay, let's get you to New York City, let's get you on my show, and let's talk about what you want to do. And then in that day or in that week, you have raised the amount of money that you need to, to build the two schools. Like, it's the only reason I care about influence. And, um, that's how I view it. You know, it's, it's, a, it's a long game. It takes a long time. I've been at this for five years now, every single day, 80 hours a week. And, um, 
every single week and very you know very little vacation and it's like I know why I care about how it plays out in the end and it's 100% because I want to put other people on and because I want to use my voice and my experience to share honest truth with people and hope that they find some value in that. Mm-hmm. So you've been um, in this for a while yeah. and um, I see that you love helping others reach their goals, but do you have a specific high point that you can think of, like a moment that was really special or that stands out? Yes, it's very... It's, it's, very, it's, very, it's very easy. I'll tell you the best moment of my professional career so far. Okay. Actually, there are two. I'll tell you both of them. The first one is, um, well, I'll just tell you one of them because the it's too long. The, here, here's the, mo- the biggest moment. When I was growing up, my, par- my, my father and my mother were both teachers. They both taught. Uh, my father taught seventh grade. My mom taught kindergarten. When I was born, my dad said, I need to make more money for the family. Uh, we're not making hardly any money, and I, they wanted to have a bunch of kids. So my dad went and started a career as a stockbroker. He was a financial advisor for a small firm in, in Peoria, Illinois. And um, he didn't know anything about the financial markets, nothing. He, he studied social studies, he studied history, he knew nothing. And at this time, there was no internet. So he would literally, he tells me this now, he would literally take out the phone book and go through the yellow pages and make cold call after cold call and like it wasn't like buy my coffee mugs right which like every household basically needed it was like trust me with your money the guy you don't know trust the guy you don't know to manage your money like thinking about how insane that was for him um is hilarious to me now because it's just now that he's you know he's had a career now for almost 40 years as a financial advisor very successful career um, and, and so, so when we were growing up, my dad was really trying to make it on his own and, and, you know, we didn't, we were like, we weren't starving, but we, you know, he, he would take our whole family to Disney world, right? He would go to Disney world and at the time I didn't know it, but it was a huge financial, uh, responsibility and it was a huge financial investment and sacrifice that he and my mom would make. And so the older I got, the more I realized how big of a financial sacrifice that was. And so my, in my mind, when I started my business, I said, when I hit a certain number of dollars in my bank account, I'm gonna surprise my parents and I'm gonna take them back to Disney World and I'm gonna treat them to the same nice hotel that they took us to. And I'll never forget that a couple of years ago, I was able to do that. And I took them to Disney World, and I'll, I remember I was sitting, this is, and this was the moment, I was sitting on the balcony of this hotel with my dad, and the song Beauty and the Beast came on. There's a piano player in the lobby of the hotel. And the song Beauty and the Beast came on, and that was this, my favorite song growing up as a kid, my favorite song, to the point where I learned how to play it on the piano because I was so inspired by the piano player that played Beauty and the Beast when I was a kid at that hotel. With your grandma, no? With my grandma. Oh my God, your memory is amazing. And I would, okay. and we would play it every Christmas Eve at my grandma's house. And I remember, while I t- when I took my dad and my mom back to Disney World that year, the guy started playing Beauty and the Beast, and my dad started crying. And I think I've seen my dad cry twice in my whole life, but that's a very strong era of men. And you know, I pretended like I didn't see him crying because I didn't want him to, you know, he wouldn't like it that he knew that I, he, I saw him crying. But I remember thinking like this, like this is probably one of the best moments of my whole life, and uh, and you know for so many reasons he probably was crying. It probably made him think of his mom and the piano playing the Christmas Eve and like how far the family has come and the fact that his son took him back to this hotel. Like I'm sure there's a lot of emotions running through his head, but um, that for me was like I made it. Like that was like the I've made it moment as an entrepreneur. I, I told I've told you that story before. Yes. Oh my God, amazing. Your memory is incredible. But you always tell it so well. I'm always so impressed. Thank but that's, you, you know, what you do. So Thank this, you. This makes sense. <laughs> um, so that was a high point. Um, yeah. what, what has been a challenge or a struggle for you, and how did leadership skills um, specifically help you overcome that? I think the biggest challenge for me is, is always the same thing, which is how do I find balance? 
you know and so I'll speak I'll speak kind of at a macro level and then I'll speak at a micro level at a macro level balance has been a hard thing for me I've had to sacrifice a lot like it's it's been hard for me to have uh, romantic relationships because my lifestyle is, is very unique um, six to seven months a year traveling um, while I'm in a city like I'm gone at nine in the morning I come home at 10 11 at night like I'm really I'm really cranking and um, and you know there are, it's, it's hard for a lot of people to accept and then you know seeing friends and, and having time for family and all this stuff I, I try really 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 hard to make that, these things happen but sometimes it's a struggle from a, on a micro level and, and the answer to like how do I deal with that is like I just do the best that I can and I just continuously tweak like if I'm tired on a Saturday I'll take a Saturday and Sunday off if I feel like I'm neglecting my girlfriend I'll spend you know the whole weekend off my phone if I feel like I haven't seen my parents enough I'll go surprise them like I just do the best that I can and I'm always checking in with myself about that because the people in my life are super important um, but but on a, on a micro level, I remember, you know, for the first 18 months of the business in San Francisco, I was delusional about what it was going to be like to be an entrepreneur. I thought it was just kind of like this great lifestyle and spending time in bed and being in my pajamas and like, you know, but, but that, the money quickly ran out and I had to basically rent out my apartment in San Francisco on Airbnb while I went and used that money that I would make, that I would profit from the Airbnb put it back into like my basic expenses, paying that rent, you know, whatever f food fees I had, whatever business needs I had, and then crashing on friends' couches for weeks and sometimes months at a time, renting really cheap, crappy rooms in like Oakland. And, um, and it was all because I, I believe so much. And then, you know, how did leadership play a part of, of being able to overcome those obstacles? I just believed so much in what I was doing. You know, and I think that that's something that all great leaders that I talk to, there's like a blind optimism that we all share. I mean, I am probably the most optimistic person you'll ever meet, and it's blind. It's literally the only option I give myself, and for better or for worse, and in some cases it, it, it's, it's an incredible asset, in some cases it comes back to bite me in the ass, but like, for better or for worse, I will always be a blind optimist, and uh, it's, it's what got me through it. It was like, this will be a good story to tell. This will be a good story to tell. This will be a good story to tell. This will be a fun story when I'm speaking at Madison Square Garden. This will be a fun story to tell. Like, and so I've always just thought about that, that from a leadership perspective, it's seeing the glasses half full, always finding the good in all the situations. Like when I was living in Oakland in this little tiny room, I just, you know, every night I would go, there was a really cool little salsa, I know you love salsa dancing, there's a really cool little salsa dancing spot uh, that I could walk to in 12 minutes and I took a salsa dancing uh, Rueda class every single night. And for me, like, that was a silver lining. You know, the, oh, maybe the neighborhood wasn't so nice, but like, I could go take a class and I could go write all day and like, so just optimism, blind optimism, half full and positivity like your brain is incredible like what you can do with your mind is is actually unbelievably incredible if you can channel it the right way you are literally unstoppable because no matter what happens you're going to be good i've been learning that kind of leadership has been changing over time back in the day leadership was kind of seen as more of like a manager who was always like a big strong guy who was commanding and almost led by like force and power and knowledge and now it seems that it's more trending on inspiration and people skills um so what are your hopes for the leaders of today and for the future and what do you think the kind of qualities that they need to have to you know lead people yeah i love that question i think like for me the most important thing in a leader is is like a combination of Con like consciousness and I don't mean like you know what's happening with the planet consciousness I mean like what do the people around you care about and and I just I'm such a big believer in over communicating like mm -hmm. oh grossly over communicating sometimes like painfully over communicating I'm all about that okay. yeah yeah <laughs> and like literally checking with people because it changes every day like what Nick wants today might be completely different tomorrow 
or completely different in a year. Maybe he falls in love. Maybe he wants to work way less. Maybe he wants to travel. Maybe he wants to start his own thing. Like, you're completely naive if you think that this is how it's going to be forever. And so, as a leader, I am not scared of the changes that people want. I actually want to support the changes. And most leaders, and most bad relationships in general, I think why people fail is you try to control everything. I'm not trying to control anything. I'm going to control me. And I'm 100% in charge of me. But everybody else, I can, I simply cannot control. And the more I try to control, the more they're going to backlash. No one wants to be controlled. So the first thing I would say is like, be conscious about what's happening around you every day and know that the needs of the people that make you and your business run will always be changing. And the more you can communicate with them about how you can help them or at least know that this is what they want is a really good idea. The second thing I would say is like, I think that a big thing with leadership right now is like, just be really nice to people. Like, you know, the the whole notion that the meaner you are to your employees and the more you treat them like slaves, the more that they'll do for you, I think is just like done. I mean, there are so many creative ways to make money now and there are so many different opportunities out there now that especially millennials really don't want to be treated poorly. So, you know, some people tell me you're too nice to your staff. I, I hear that from people all the time. You're too nice to your staff. And it, like, that's just never gonna change for me. Like I just, it's just my truth. Like I, I like these guys, I love these guys. And I would do anything like, so I don't think you have to be a dick or a bitch to be a successful leader. And that's kind of a, a misconception. And the last thing I would say is, <clears throat> Empathy, like empathy is so important, knowing that um, people have stuff going on in their lives. I mean, I can't even tell you the, and this is like, if I had a superpower, if someone said, what is your superpower? My superpower is I can feel everything that's happening around me. I can feel the people around me. And I know what they're thinking, I know what they're feeling. Maybe not exactly what they're thinking and exactly what they're feeling, but I basically know what's going on with them with zero verbal communication. And what do you do with that, right? And so many people are so in their own head and so self-centered that like they never take the time as leaders to figure out, okay, what is, so there's the over communication part, which is part one, but then part three is like, how do you even know when to have that communication? You gotta really feel stuff. So I just have two more questions, sure. but this kind of leads into my next question, which was, um, there's so much out there, so many people talking to some other shows, why do you think people listen to you? And I know this kind of has been asked, but more specifically, um, why do you think people follow you, listen to you? That's a great question. I don't know the answer to that. I think, you know, I think that possibly because of the things that we've talked about, the optimism, the half full... Okay. Um, you know, I think maybe people have met me in real life and they like, like, cause I'm on the, I, I, I speak so much that like people come to conferences and they, they like that. I think it's an energy thing, Renny. Like why do me and you get along so well? Why do, <clears throat> you know, like why are the people on my team on my team? Like what is the reason behind all of it? I really do think that there is like an energetic thing happening, um, in the world. I, I don't know, like. I don't know what it is. I don't know how to define it, but I do think that like you, you, you can do as much as you can do to be a good person, and then the, the rest kind of just comes to you. Um, and I think also, you know, we we work really hard to ask people that follow us what else they want to hear, and what else they want to learn, and what are the content pieces they want to have, and then we create those. And um, I'm just very interactive with my audience. And that, I think that people could feel that. And then I think more than anything, like I love what I do so much and I think that people just feel that. And, and in a world where people are so desperate to connect with something that, they, that makes them feel alive, even if it's for the three or four or five minutes that you watch a YouTube video or if you listen to this 35 minute you know, recording, like I just think people want to connect with positivity pretty desperately in a world that's, that's kind of negative and um, it's just a real honor to like deliver that to people. I think that um, someone who is true to self is very attractive because 
like you said, a lot. that's ultimately what you want to do. You can only work on yourself. You want to be the best version of yourself. So when you see someone that has what you want or that exemplifies the kind of person you want to be, you gravitate it to that person so you can learn. Yeah. So, I mean, you are a natural leader. <laughs> why I that's chose so you. sweet. Thank you. I, I, I really appreciate that. Um, last question uh, is that, you know, I'm on this journey studying leadership and organizational development. Um, what advice would you give to me or to any emerging leader to success? Except? I think, uh, I, I think like do stuff where you can be a leader, mm -hmm. you know, put yourself in positions where you can actually, you know, I think that it's great to advance learning and for mm -hmm. learning's sake, but I think that like, I'm just such a big fan of practical implementation of actual real life scenarios. So you have a job, I mean, you knowing you, right, and being friendly with you, it's like you have a job that is super important where you actually get to lead every single day. So what I would do um, is every single day at my job, I would probably start to create content around what did you learn today? What was the leadership lesson that you learned? What was the leadership lesson that you implemented? Maybe you do a learn and implement, right? Or you know, you know, Rennie's learning and implementation of leadership, right? So it's like, today I learned this technique and here's how it played out and here's what I did and here's how it worked. And this can literally just be like a video that you shoot on your iPhone um, and it's one or two minutes every day. And then maybe you turn that into an audio book. I don't know, but like, I just think that actually trying stuff every day is a really good idea. And, um, and, then, and then look at people that you admire and ask them just a simple question like, what does leadership mean to you? Or when was the last time that you felt like you were a really empowered leader and what did you do? Ask your mom, you know, we, we share a mutual love for your mom. Um, she's a very, you know, very creative soul and a great leader in her own way and, and, and you are as well. So I would say, look, look for those things, you know, ask the ladies that you work with, give them a big kiss for me, I love them and had such a good time with them here in New York. Um, yeah. But, but ask them what they think and, and then, you know, maybe you do a, maybe you start a leadership podcast of your own, you know, and, and, and then be, you know, the best way to become a leader is just to not, not try to, to, uh, educate, what's the word, uh, when you, when you're like thinking so much about education, like not try so much to like theorize. Right. Leadership, but actually just try it and see right. see how it works. And you know, leadership on the salsa dancing floor. I mean, there are so many places that leadership is happening. And you know, what? Why do you feel really comfortable dancing with someone? What are the things that he or she does when he or she leads you on a, in a salsa dance that makes you feel like you are, you are ready to follow? What do you do as a leader? Like, there are just so many different places to explore it. Uh, I would just literally start looking at my life every day as one big leadership lesson. Absolutely. Well, I am so lucky to work in a place that is so supportive of me. So I am constantly inventing projects and changing things and yeah. being on leadership roles, which is why my um, supervisor said, hey, Renny, have you ever thought about doing this? You're like, this is what you do all the time. That's here. so nice. This. And how? And let me ask you a question. How much more excited are you to go into work because of that support? So much more. Oh See? my God! It's why I, I do not love DC. Let me tell you, but I stay. Come to New York. What? Come to New York. <laughs> because I, you know, I feel so supported and loved at work, and I yeah. have these coworkers that appreciate me, and there's nurses with 20 years in who come to me to hear my advice or want to know how me work on a project to hear my ideas and it's just like such an open place not competitive and it's like it's wonderful I couldn't ask for a better place that's so incredible so I get to practice all my leadership stuff and at work and at school at the same time so that's incredible so that's I mean you got it you got all the answers right there yay <laughs> um well those were my questions cool thank you so much my pleasure Thank you. Thank you for your time.